Okay, so I'm going to hit off with the first question. Uh, as Terry mentioned, uh, with Twilio, they now are at a billion dollar run rate. They like to quote run rate than absolute revenues, you know. Uh, BABS, as always. So, but they have built out their own platform. They've built out a ton of developer tools that meet a whole range of different developer needs and constituencies. And even though it, the platform is supposed to sell itself, they have a massive sales force, uh, just handling all the inbound leads they get. So, I'm interested on each of the panelists' views on should we just give up trying to catch up with Twilio and let them dominate and overcharge? Who wants to kick that one off? Oh, did you into the mic? No, 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 no. Christopher, go for it, but into the mic, so because we, we're streaming on the internet. I mean, Twilio is completely out of touch with um, reality when it comes to pricing and Like their main providers, you fired them as a company pricing doesn't their pricing doesn't match what they have to environment it, in my opinion it works with developers charting trying to start something up because it doesn't know anything better there's a point where that that scale just breaks it's not for wholesale anybody else on the panel um well i think that uh Everybody is competing with them, right? I mean, I mean that's uh, today uh, the name of the game is in the in the communication platform as a service market is to close the gap with Twilio. Um, so everybody is uh, putting their APIs out there, uh, trying to rebrand themselves as a developer company, and um, trying to compete on price. So uh, they're gonna feel the heat. I mean, Twilio is is feeling the heat, uh, especially when it comes to high volume, big revenue customers that are looking to add multi-vendor relationships. Uh, that being said, uh, what makes Twilio unique is not their products and is not their platform, is their brand and their hundred million plus dollar they invest in their brand and customer acquisition on a yearly basis. And if you don't have that amount of money and expertise to, to build a strong brand, then um, there's really no point to compete with them on that, on that level. So you end up competing on price. Um, there's another way of looking at the market as well is can you compete with them on solving the customer problem but differently? maybe through other means, non-API means. I think that's an interesting topic to discuss as well. Excellent, Tony. Harold. Yep, I'm down that vein as well. There's plenty of meat on the bone because of their pricing and the fact that they aren't staying in touch with it. Uh, they've got, as far as they're concerned, the world wrapped up and around their finger, and it looks like that. But at the end of the day, some of the smaller guys that are out there, they are getting those niche markets where they're coming in and, and starting snapping at, at the bottom and, and starting to pull some of those bigger customers because now they're kind of giving that um, that white glove treatment. So instead of you being a customer and you're just cha-ching, you actually become an advocate with them. So you can build your brand by, again, as we hear, heard this morning from Terry, myself, and others, and especially Chris, it's all about your employees and how you interact with your customers. And if you can add that value to it, then uh, that'll take you over the top and you'll be able to get your chunk of the bone of, uh, of CPAS. There's plenty out there. Yeah, because I really enjoyed the similarities between what Christopher was saying and how he's building his customer, uh, companies and you know some of the simple advice that you are providing. So it's, again, coming to partnering and building that customer relationship. Terry. Yeah, um, I, I think Twilio is... Uh, has been very successful. You know, very few companies in the public market can grow at 80%. Yeah. So if you look at that, it's it's incredible. Tony's absolutely right. The brand they have built has a very large lead over the rest of the market. Now, having said that, uh, the market is huge. The, the growth is huge. So there's m many ways to uh, to slice the bread. Uh, you know, a couple examples. One was what we talked about is a private cloud implementation. The other one uh, I, you know, we talk about is, for example, um, I'll use this analogy, right? If you want to go to the Twilio party, you have to go through their front door. You have to use the Twilio portal with their, their APIs and else. 
Now, um, our strategy on the distribution is a little different. If you want to come to the cholera party, I don't care if you slip down through the chimney, jump through the windows, you know, crawl from the basement. I don't really care, right? What that means is we're happy to be the platform behind other people's brand. Uh, if, you're, if you're an email company that competes with Sangrid, for example, we're happy to provide the CPaaS capabilities for any of your customers, right? Twilio is never going to do that. And, and if you think about it, any Sangrid customers providing email services, any of them starts using CPaaS, they're going to lose that customer. They're going to lose it to Twilio. And Twilio has all the pricing powers. You know, this is kind of like the, the old Cineverse uh, story where they provide so many things on telecom, they would just like give you this SMS for free so that, you know, they can get the 911 service or whatever the case might be. And Twilio has the capability to do that. So I think, you know, again, uh, there's many ways to, to choose your market. And this is what I think is the most important thing as entrepreneurs is look at our target market and have a strategy for that. Uh, because otherwise, you know, if you're always thinking about in terms of catching up with somebody else, that's normally a losing game, right? We, we say, you know, if you can't beat them with their rules, well, ch they'll change your rules. <laughs> exactly, and that's a great point. And it actually points back to one of the reasons why Harold mentioned he joined VoIP Innovations, because they had the showroom, so they were making it very easy for people to consume the applications, the basically solutions to business problems. So that's great. Again, just looking at the audience, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask, okay? Uh, let's move on then to the next question, which is, the, yeah, and I mentioned it in the first, which is just the diversity of, let's use the word customer needs when we're talking about CPaaS, because it is very diverse. I mean, it's a telecom app server, and then basically you've got, you know, a, 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 whole range of wrap of services and capabilities around it, but it serves many different constituencies. From Terry, you gave the example of Uber with the anonymous calling, through to um, American Airlines as a tool for a large brand to basically re-engage. I've seen, for example, Deutsche Telekom do exactly that same process for engaging some of the large banks in Germany with a focus on private. In, in terms of hosted solutions where everything is kept within Germany and you even knew the address where the data was being kept. Because again, you've got a whole host of regulatory and compliance issues there. So I mean, you mentioned, yes, you know, focus, change the game, but where's the opportunity given it's not just CPAS Twilio does, it's doing all the email stuff, it's within its ecosystem, it's got a whole host of enterprise communications, it's now basically got, you know, 80, 95 percent, depending on who you talk to, a uh, contact center solution out there. So it's sort of across the programmable telecom space, it's pretty broad coverage. So where, given that coverage, can and its brand dominance are the opportunities? I think you find the opportunity trying well, uh, going through your own stuff like in the middle of something you're gonna have an inspiration that's gonna show you something that's like aha this like aha this makes sense like um, example some of the things that we made a long time ago with SMS like we made like uh, we took the Mojave phone booth I don't know if you're familiar with that phone booth in the middle of the desert the Mojave Desert I had a phone number long stuff long story short we ended up getting a number and we turned it into a conference center and we also turned it into like an IRC thing where you could text message it, subscribe your, your nickname. And uh, it responds back. And then now you're inside this group of channels and you can you know, communicate with people. And we did it for the DEF CON conference. But it was so people could communicate from a way of like having their own personal numbers, bypassing um, mobile carrier filters, but the way that we were routing so that we could have this type of communication. And that, we ended up taking that and putting that into another reiteration of that, like years later, into our Zip 911 product. Because, like, you find certain things that are useful, and then it just clicks, oh, well, actually, regular, everyday people can use this for something that's, that's, uh, that's uh, beneficial. So you just kind of have to find those, like, how moments, like, this makes sense, and let's just do that. Like an inspiration, like a moment of inspiration, of clarity of putting that. Exactly. Being out there and basically, you know, partly how we run Tad Hack. 
It's just think about the problems as soon as you see the problem because we're all telecom geeks. You sort of go, oh, you know what? There's a technology we can use for that. That's a good point. Harold? Yeah, so uh, Cisco did a, a crazy thing back in the day as they were introducing their Spark board and really the WebEx teams and how it collaborated. So when you look at what they did, they, they set up these big boards, one in Beijing, one kind of in, uh, it might have been Chicago, but definitely in L.A., and they let people see people and talk through people. And it's those kind of gestalt moments that you don't know where it's going or, or what they're doing and, and the gestures there. The same thing that they did where they provided these to hospitals now so that uh, famous stars and things can, can reach out and talk to a group of, of children and stuff. It's really looking at that, that give back part. I don't think I've seen a report anywhere where Twilio's done anything like that. So if you think about it, as you add that, that part to your project and those things. I mean, back in the day at uh, Voxio Labs uh, Dropo, we actually did the mobile disaster center where we'd come out and stand up the tower just for the heck of it. Jonathan Taylor, one of the, the owners of it, really enjoyed doing that. So think about those pieces too, because that really, really does add value if you look at the community side. Exactly, that's an excellent point. So again, uh, oh sorry. Yeah, I just want to add here, I think the one of the opportunities is to solve the same problem differently. So, so essentially, it is crazy in 2019 to go talk to decision makers, CEOs and CMOs and tell them, in order for you to modernize the way you engage with your customers, here's a bunch of APIs, you need to go hire developers and build it. Uh, and the more I talk to customers, the more I realize actually their developers don't want to do this. They, they, they're not, they don't want to deal with, you know, building the way because they inter interact with their customers. It's not their expertise. They don't like to do it. I mean, they want to really empower the product folks and the marketing folks to do that. And in many instances, the code of that interaction is actually embedded into uh, some, some rep code repository somewhere and the, the CMO and the CEO, CEO can't really visualize the way uh, this flow is happening. So um, that's the problem. That's a business opportunity that Twilio is recognizing and is trying to address, but I think that there's much different ways of addressing it than in through APIs and, and developer community. Absolutely, absolutely. And we saw with uh, Dinesh yesterday in how he creates these simple wizards to make it easy for product owners, marketing, you know, sort of customer relationship managers to be able to create very simple applications using SMS to engage without needing to go through the whole stack and development stack to uh, create something. Perry, do you want to add anything? Yeah, absolutely. If you look at the ecosystem uh, from the market perspective, I'm going to bring up Dinesh's product as well because if you think about it, like my parking meter example, um, not every city wants to hire a fleet of developers to create that solution. So if they could actually just go on some interface and configure it, there's no reason that they couldn't put that into, uh, into deployment very quickly. So that's, that's obviously a great opportunity of some sort of, uh, you know, the, the old days we call them system integrators or whatever, some middle, the middleware that take the CPaaS applications and be able to deploy them in the marketplace. The other opportunity that people probably don't think about is more intelligence and capabilities at the mobile operator side. Um, you know, this, some of these, um, right now, if you receive, for example, if you receive a, a, a call from the Uber driver, you have no idea it's the Uber driver. You know, there's no reason that the, the carrier does, couldn't tell you what's going on, right? Um, Anti-spam is a big problem, and this is what initiated the, 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 the Twilio petition that um, Eric talked about yesterday, that they wanted SMS to be regulated because the operators right now just don't have a very good ways to, um, to dif distinguish uh, spam versus valid traffic. If you um, if you put it's kind of funny, right? Like because um, some of the, the the SMS reply, if you reply stop, and if you have the word stop in it, they think you want to stop the, the, the you know you want to stop you want to stop the opt in and you want to opt out. 
but, but lots of messages could start with stop, like, you know, hey, stop, uh, stop by to pick me up or something. And they think you're, you're opting out. <laughs> so things of that nature, the, the, the networks need to be more intelligent as well. I, th I think that's a great point, Terry, you're making. I think the, the challenge of Twilio and other providers in that case is they are too telco. You know, the telco industry didn't make it easy for them to create that abstraction layer. And let's say if we have developers here in the audience, like, you know, uh, they don't understand why they need to go and buy short code in the U.S. and respect, you know, different regulation for different carriers and uh, trying to understand how to design their code to avoid being caught in a filter of a carrier. Like, this is insane. So... I think the next phase in this industry is really to abstract that uh, and maybe, I hope, cut out the carrier altogether. I mean, we are at the WebRTC conference. Uh, so I think time has come for the telco uh, infrastructure to get away from not becoming an obstacle anymore to, to build uh, great customer engagement applications. That was so below the belt to be calling <laughs> Twilio to telco, but it was beautiful. Well, I think a start was the word SIP, and now it's a data baby. But then, I mean, that raises the interesting question in terms of, you know, bypass. So, you know, it, because it is, and it's not just in North America. I mean, North America is particularly peculiar, but around the world, there are so many different rules, and it changes from carrier to carrier. I mean, that's why there's this great hope that, I mean, Line has it locked down. Uh, you know, they have a great A to P platform, but it's all contained within the line ecosystem. WhatsApp, of course, is trying to do something more open, but that's part of an evil organization uh, that spies on people. And really, let's face it, throughout their history has struggled to deal with developers. Here you go, build on this. Oh, sorry, it's gone away now. Although, it, because again, Bay Area monopolies, they do these sort of things. So, you know, we have SMS. It's the lowest common denominator. Uh, with all the trials and tribulations, bypass still looks tough. So what's, do we just wait and just do omni-channel and hope something happens? What's the way forward with respect to messaging? I'm, I'm going to take a stab at it. Um, we talk a lot about the RCS problem yesterday. Um, I think it would be great because if you look at the ecosystem, it doesn't, right now it doesn't work if you're a brand or if you're enterprise. Um, and you say, okay, I want to, I want to make my content or application once and be able to do all the, um, endpoint. It wouldn't work like that today. Um, so I would actually think it would be great if, if, if the industry can adopt something like a, what I would call a pseudo RCS meaning everybody should be able to create the same content. And then I don't really care if you're delivering over WhatsApp or Facebook or Line or, or SMS or whatever. It will show up uh, the, way, you know, the way it's meant to. But the point is that on the creation or on the developer or on the enterprise brand side, they only have to do it once. And then it's the same format. So. Um, I don't know if there's a way how the industry get to that point, but that will be a great outcome. Now, just cherry on that point, is that, in your thinking, a federated model or an aggregated model? Um, well, it's, it's not even aggregated. My, my point is, that if, you, if you look at the content side, the problem right now is you cannot create the same content and deliver it over, over all these different channels. Right. Unless it's a SMS and up. So my point is take it to this, a pseudo RCS and everybody agree that's a standard uh -huh. and then you create the content once and they, you don't really care how it gets delivered. Understood. The end device is going to show up. You know, if it's Facebook, Facebook take it, deliver it, whatever, how they do it. But the content is created once in the same way. Okay, just hang a sec. We said the RCS word. Oh, just hang a sec. It's not on. Just switch it on. So, so that's basically like MIME for email, where you can have whatever email client you like, but that you, you, you know, you, within reasonable boundaries, 
your content e email content will render anywhere. All right, it's text or HTML. But so, so essentially, it's basically having a lowest common denominator. Yeah. I'm not sure that makes sense for messaging um, inherently. Yeah, because you have inherent differences between all messaging. And in fact, you're incentivized as a messaging application developer to create unique features so that there is ideally no common denominator goes across them. A good example being Snapchat with ephemerality. Do you have ephemerality as one of your, um, you know, one of your lowest common denominator features? Um, what about encryption as well? So, so there's, there's various sort of mutually exclusive features which probably mean you can't get to lowest common denominator. Any comments to that? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a totally valid uh, comment, and I think uh, there's no doubt that the world is moving towards more and more channels, messaging channels, and diversification of the feature of each channel. You mentioned Snapchat. Uh, um, you know, WhatsApp has lots of regulation around it, and uh, Apple iMessage, uh, the business chat also has its own regulation. I mean, not to mention the SMS, different regulation by country. I mean, uh, I think the world is going into more and more uh, diversity of channels, and companies actually like Nexmo has developed APIs that uh, create maybe first version of this abstraction uh, layer. It's called the dispatch messaging API, where you send a message and it gets formatted to a different uh, available channels behind the scenes. Um, I think it's a first step, and they're going to be more and more of these abstraction layers. Actually, in, in marketing automation software, you, ha you have some of that uh, uh, use cases where uh, you email and push and, and, and messaging those different flavors can also be adapted and abstracted. Um, and there's company raised, you know, over $100 million each in, in marketing automation platform to replace marketers of the world. I think this is happening also from that angle. Um, that being said, uh, my hope is in 10 years from now, you're going to have a concentration again, uh, and uh, maybe two or three channel will win uh, versus, you know, the, the 50 that we have today. Uh, and uh, I think it's similar that happened with the uh, diversity of phone devices, right? Uh, 20 years ago, you had 50 different platforms, and you had to, to render the application to each of these platforms. And uh, uh, 20 years later, you have two platforms, Android and, and iPhone. That could be a potential uh, future for messaging. For most of them, um, person to person is the primary application, and A to P and B to C is secondary. And when you're in a world where P to P is the primary use case, differentiation and fragmentation makes lots of sense because people are very different and have the different uh, preferences and behaviors. And you know, there's, an, there's very few people who would like to have lowest common denominator between messaging on, I don't know, LinkedIn and Tinder, for example, or, or an airline. Yeah, they're all very, very different use cases. And well, certainly uh, lowest common denominator probably shouldn't apply. Any, uh, exactly. Any I'm just thinking, yeah, you get yeah. United <laughs> Alerts on Tinder. You know, I think that there will be so, – yeah. <laughs> so I think that you know, we'll see a subset there rather than it being universal because I think within peer to peer there has to be a whole list of differentiation. Otherwise, it's not sticky. But for the application to person, I, you know, it, it's finding that subset that's good enough. Because, again, you're never going to get 100% penetration with messaging. It's always, can we get at least into the 90s? You know, uh, and that, that's the key. Well, I mean, it's kind of like the Wild West in a sense where, you know, like, um, like you have to create your own logarithms and understand what mobile carrier providers are getting in the way of you and communicating with your customers or your customers, their customers. Because, you know, if, if, if you send out a blast message to all of your customers using your company telephone number, they're not all going to go through. Like, the percentage is very low and what's going to get caught through because of the mobile carrier filter. But if you say one step ahead, I'm legitimate trying to get your message to your customer. There's a lot of different ways to do that and get those messages with a very high uh, a success rate. But I, I think that's, like, what we're all really kind of have to deal with in that type of space, overcoming other people's limitations. Yeah. 
which, I, you know, blockchain, anyone's talked about that here yet, but I mean, one of the other companies that I'm, that I'm, that I have going right now that we're working on is a lot of it's the blockchain space where, you know, you can verify messages, you can verify calls that are being, you can verify call porting that's happening. And, um, to me, that's like, there's a lot of problems to be solved that's never been solved in that space where you can use blockchain for something good. I can go to any town in America and spend about an hour researching the infrastructure there and spend about five minutes writing up a script that I don't I'm not even a developer and I could take down the entire 911 for that entire state. That shouldn't like happen. You shouldn't be able to do that. And so, I mean, when you look at these things, you gotta look at like the obstacles that you're trying to get past and creative and getting past them with good intent. Great, thanks. Now, again, any questions from the audience? We've got a great panel here. This is a unique mix. Just want to wrap up then. If we're you know, Alan, on that last part, you know, it's really for messaging. It's it's what what Chris had mentioned. Just the whole panel up here. It's the success rate. That's the part that eats at and causes the most angst for everybody that I talked about SMS. How do I get the data back from the carrier that says it went through? Of course, the IO message for Apple's messenger and all the different chats, they have it because they're going over their own private and they're, they're doing it that way. But the, the big thing for me, the common denominator for me that would make SMS or what I do in CPAS world better is I could have more reliability to the deliverability of that message and be told why. I can't tell you how many hours we do at every of the customer, or all the places that I've worked trying to chase that down. We can eventually get it, but it's it's not easy. Well, Tony did a lot of that. Talk, talk to an excellent <laughs> one about that. Maybe, yeah, that'll give you some insight. Direct carrier deals. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. So let's just wrap up on the last question. So this is longer term, looking into the future uh, with CPASS. Is this business going to get swallowed up by the big cloud providers, Amazon, Google, perhaps even Microsoft? Please, any views, just chip in. All right, I'll jump in. The bottom line is they're all going to add and bite and taste and do it, but they're not going to go at it wholeheartedly. So you're not going to have the, the right customer interaction. They're going to provide it. I mean, what I, the, the beauty for me for Google is the fact that they'll go buy something that's proprietary and then they'll open source it which is which crazy to most businessmen, but I've seen them do it time and time again. So at the end of the day, to get that concierge service and to make sure that you have the dedication, the private cloud that uh, Terry talked about is exactly that point. You're always gonna need that. So they're not gonna provide it. They do have some things, so they've got better HIPAA and they got better government and all that. They've added those bits and pieces, but it's not thorough. It's not gonna cover the edge cases. Uh, there is no doubt that they're going to get into it um, for the main reason is that they are really betting on the B2B uh, cloud uh, infrastructure and, and services space. It's becoming an ever more important revenue stream for them, especially Amazon and Microsoft. Um, and, um, and, and they need to diversify. They need to go up in the stack from pure storage and computing to higher value added services. And programmable communication is definitely one area that they want to go into. And actually, they're already in it. Amazon has uh, Amazon Connect, which is one of the main disruptive contact center offering. Yep. It's pretty cool, actually. Uh, they have Amazon Pinpoint, uh, which is a, a kind of a messaging orchestration layer over email, push, and SMS. And, uh, um, and, and Google actually have, have an internal uh, team that is probably as big as Nexmo that is just managing uh, carrier relation and they have internal APIs. So for them, it's really a matter of opening this up to the public and, and merging it with their uh, cloud B2B uh, uh, division. Uh, so yeah, I mean, they are, they are definitely coming and uh, some of them are already doing it. Exactly. Christopher? I think it's all going to come down to really like uh, culture in the end. because I think there's going to be a big shift in that as things are moving forward. But there's always going to be a David and Goliath, an optimist, and I always want to be on the side of David. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah. Um, it's always been uh, the on the investment side, on the investment community, um, everybody has been saying Amazon will eventually buy Twilio. That's, that rumor has been out there for, for a long time. But if you look at it, um, Twilio trades at 15, depending on the day, 15 to 20x revenues. 
um, and that is very rich. It's just it's going to be very difficult for any public company to buy that kind of uh, multiple. Um, they could buy next one. Said. <laughs> <laughs> they could buy that next one. Yeah, or oh, Calera here for that matter. But um, but I think the point is. Yes, there's definitely going to be more consolidation. I think if you take a Silicon Valley view, um, telecom has been a horrible place to invest. So, you know, everybody in Silicon Valley, I would say most of them did not believe in Twilio, right? They did not believe Twilio, and it's just really ironic. Twilio was the first company come out of Silicon Valley to break the drought of IPO in 2000. 16, when all of the Silicon Valley, I mean, if you pitch a telecom-related company there, you will know they just don't believe in it. Um, so I think it's really interesting. I think from the investment market perspective, um, the CPAS companies are very rich, richly value right now, and that makes it difficult uh, for other companies to buy it. The other thing I would make point out is for the UCAS and CPAS companies, they don't, it's not a natural fit because the sales and marketing channels are all different. Um, the implementation is all different. There's, not, there's really no synergy between UCAS and CPAS companies, uh, even though there's only like one letter difference. Right? Right. Um, so I think at the end of the day, you got to look at the, the basic foundations, and um, there's no question. I think a lot of the consolidation, I believe, will be more geographically um, um, uh, motivated, yeah, no, because yeah, for for any cloud company to be to not to be global, it's it's not really you know it's it's not a good starting point. But I think more, I think more consolidation will be more geographically uh, motivated. Sorry, Terry, because we're coming up on time. I just want to squeeze one last question in, yeah, Dinesh. Yeah, quick question. I think on because Apogee was uh, acquired by um, Google couple of years back, I'd like to get some feedback on how was that integration and how did they kind of bring some of those um, CPaaS things through Google to the market? Well, so yeah, so Apigee was a, um, an API management platform. Uh, so like for, especially actually a lot of telcos had their APIs management on, on Apigee, running on Apigee but didn't really offer uh, any CPaaS enterprise services. Um, so there was really no uh, opportunity for Google to go into that market, the yeah. same market that Twilio and Nexmo are on. Exactly. It was BS. Again, back to my Bay Area, Bay Area bullshit. And I actually have a weblog written where I was explaining how uh, Apogee was not a CPaaS and I had got very irate emails telling me I was completely wrong and I needed to travel over to the Bay Area to be learned on how I was wrong. And thank you, Tony, I, uh, <laughs> for backing up. It's API management. Oh, one question. I just had one question when you're done. One last question, hopefully. Okay, go on. We'll squeeze it in. Oh, you're the. Oh, you got it? Good. Go for it. So uh, this morning you guys talked about. Um, uh, the, it, the, the telcos as inhibitor to this space, and you just mentioned uh, investors are not keen on the space. So how, how do you, how, what can we take away from bandwidth.com and what they've been able to do as a traditional telco moving into this space and have a similar multiple to, uh, to Twilio? Yeah, uh, bandwidth is, uh, I, I call them a genius, right? Because, because they're, they're very far from the CPOS player. They're the U.S. market only, 93% of their revenue is on voice and VLAC services. Um, and what they did, um, they, they obviously don't trade at that multiple, but they, they're certainly, you know, close, you know, they're, they're, they're a, way above a telecom company multiple, uh, not quite at the Twilio level multiple, but what they did was they make their financial statements exactly like Twilio's. Obviously the numbers are different, but, but they dress themselves up like a CPAS through the lens of the financial statements, um, not through the market. <laughs> and great analyst relations as well. And, and they also like outsource most of their stuff at the beginning. So like someone else built their portal. 
keep that in mind when you guys are doing something, you're building something. If you need to outsource something, outsource it, but make sure you can control it, and maintain the build, and there's integrity in it. But Bandwidth is a great company. It's kind of in, in, in this scenario where Twilio was their customer. They fired their customer, and now they're competing with their customer. So, uh, Actually, uh, putting Bandwidth aside, which I agree with Terry, is more kind of a, a repackaging uh, financial exercise. Uh, I think software enabled communication is hot right now in the market. We have Zoom, uh, amazing IPO, uh, Twilio, you have uh, uh, Vonage, you have uh, Ring Central, all kind of highly valued companies out there, uh, and for good reasons. They have high quality revenue, uh, high gross margin, uh, relatively high growth. I mean, Ring Central growing at 30% a year. Twilio at over 50, uh, uh, Nexmo, CPAS, uh, Avonage has been growing at 49% last quarter. So these are very good numbers today, high quality revenue for Wall Street. So uh, telco, I mean, communication enabled software is, is back in the game when it comes to public market perception. Okay, so with that, let's show appreciation for an excellent panel. Thank you so much, guys.